with it. So my name is Natalie Watson. I'm one of the Laryngology Fellows at Guy's and St. Thomas's. And welcome to the ENT Virtual Grand Rounds. Thank you, Ishan, for the invitation to introduce my current supervisor and mentor. Today's guest is Mr. Yakubu Karagama. He is one of the leading ENT surgeons in the UK. He leads the multidisciplinary specialist voice clinic at Guy's and St. Thomas's NHS Trust in London. He has a specialist interest in airway, the professional voice and dysphagia. He is at the frontier of promoting and developing new surgical techniques to help patients and he's dedicated to helping patients. He is also a dedicated mentor and trainer. He is founder and course director for the Manchester and London phonosurgery courses. Uh, he has authored and co-authored over 50 publications and book chapters and is a council member of the British Laryngological Association, having been the first secretary of the association in 2011. So I can't wait to hear Mr. Karagama's um, endoscopic management of dysphagia talk. So here is a virtual round of applause for Mr. Yakubu Karagama. Right. So this topic is going to be based on my practice, based on what I do here. Um, and also I'm going to uh, show you some of the case studies uh, that I've done as well. So uh, dysphagia, I think one of the commonest causes of dysphagia is a high dysphagia. And when I say high dysphagia is around the cryopharyngeal area, you do get patients that have got dysphagia due to uh, neurological, neurological conditions like weakness in the tongue base area and the follicular and the pharynx as well. But most of the ones that I come across as an ENT surgeon are the dysphagia that are related to cryopharynx. So you can see there is a very complex area of the upper esophagus and uh, uh, this muscle can cause lots of problems and i.e. can be a stricture, a web, a hypertrophy or spasm or a bar, it could be a pharyngeal pouch, you could have foreign body there in the pharynx and sometimes down in the esophagus as well. You can have neurological dysphagia causing uh, swallow difficulty at this level or in the esophageal or in the oropharyngeal phase. You can even have functional dysph uh, dysphagia, inflammatory uh, cases, neoplastic, iatrogenic and post-operative uh, cancer cases or post-radiation. So how do you diagnose these cases? The diagnosis are normally straightforward. First of all, it's just a, a good history taking and a very good endoscopic examination and evaluation of the patient's swallow in the clinic using either fiber optic nasal endoscopy or transnasal esophagoscopy. Uh, sometimes are, you're gonna need a barium swallow, uh, video fluoroscopy. You may need CT scan and uh, MRI scan. But really, CT scan and MRI scan mostly is to exclude other causes of the dysphagia. Uh, the barium swallow and video fluoroscopy does help us towards planning of treatment. Uh, sometimes a physiological examination like pressure monometer may be required as well. So the surgical treatment that I use in my clinic are essentially uh, transnasal uh, flexible uh, treatment or a rigid pharyngoscopy. For the flexible transnasal esophagoscopy treatment, I do that in the office on the local anesthetic spray to the nasal cavities and the pharynx. And for the rigid pharyngoscopy, it will require a general anesthetic. So all of these procedures that you can see listed here uh, can be done either in the office or in the operating room depending on the patient selection. And when I say patient, patient selection, whether the patient is suitable and whether the patient will agree to have it done under local anesthetic or they might prefer to have it done under a general anesthesia. So I'm gonna start with the office balloon dilatation via the translator esophagoscopy on the local anesthetic. I'm gonna give you one example of some of the type of patients that I receive. Now, this history I've given here is of a real patient but the picture on the bottom right there, it's not the patient on this uh, history, uh, because I wouldn't like to put a patient's picture like that with their history. Uh, but I've seen patients like this presenting with this kind of symptoms. So when I say a patient like this, it means 
patients with significant comorbidity and patients with obesity, they will come to you, they, can, they will say either they cannot swallow at all or they have discomfort when they swallow. I think all of these patients should be taken serious, especially some of these patients that will come to you and say they can swallow, but it's hard to swallow. And I'm gonna give you one example as you're behind your screen now. If you can just do me one favor and just put your finger in your neck like that. Just two fingers, all of you, please. I can see a couple of you are not doing that. Yeah, that chap from, yeah, from Spain. Yeah, and you from, yeah, everyone. Yeah, I can see all of you are doing it now. Everybody is doing it now. So try swallowing your saliva. So it's not comfortable. I can see some of you are struggling to do that. Now, if you are to, to be having this kind of feeling each time you have your mouth full, it's not comfortable because eating sometimes is a pleasure. Sometimes we eat eating not just for nourishing, we, eat, we go for meals, for socializing, and you want it to be a very nice experience for you. And this is why these patients, some of them, they're not losing weight. Some of them actually, they're adding weight. One of the reasons why some of these patients will be adding weight, they will be obese is because they only rely on soft diet and most of the soft diet is just full of sugar. So when they come to you with sensation of difficulty in swallowing, don't discard them. Don't start to judge them because you can see that they're not losing weight. So what the, what's the problem? Because this patient, they're not gonna go away. So thankfully we have this in the uh, available. Uh, when I say that, it's a, the transness of sphagoscopy. We can use this to examine patients thoroughly. We can use this to manage some of these patients that don't have a very severe dysphagia and uh, we, uh, we can manage them easily in the clinic. So a TNO, a transness of sphagoscopy is really an, an elongated fiber optic nasal endoscope. So it is 60 centimeters long, about five millimeter in, in diameter, and it has a working channel as well, two millimeter. So through this channel, you can pass a guide wire for the balloon dilatation. You can pass a biopsy faucet. You can pass a laser fiber. So if you look at the picture here, a third of patients that present with pharyngeal dysphagia would have a distal cause. Now, why is that? This is because the vagus nerve supplies the top of the uh, esophagus, pharynx, and the gastroesophageal junction as well. So this patient will have a referred pain. And this is why sometimes when you have patients with otalgia, with no uh, physical signs in the ear, you do scan of their neck and some of them may have pharyngeal cancer. And equally, you may have patients with gastroesophageal junction tumor that will result with dysphagia or they may have pain in the, in, in, in the pharynx. Now, why am I saying, telling you this? I'm saying this because I want to highlight the importance of doing a transnasal sphagoscopy in patients that present with a high dysphagia because I've seen cases whereby they came to my clinic with high dysphagia and I found that they have gastroesophageal cancer. I think it's a blessing that we have this TNO available and we should make the most out of it because lots of the gastroenterologists will tell you uh, or the upper GI surgeon will tell you that esophageal cancer present late. And the reason it present late is because some of the symptoms that present with early would be just minor symptoms that could have been picked up easily if we use TNO on these patients. So what does any TNO enables us to see? With a TNO, you can examine the whole of the upper aerodigestive tract. So the nasal cavity, the pharynx, the larynx, the esophagus, the stomach, and you can also come back again and then examine the whole of the trachea. You can examine the bronchus, the terminal bronchus, all at just one sitting. And all you need to do really is just to anesthetize the nasal cavities and the vocal cords and bingo, you're ready to examine the whole of the upper digest digestive tract. This will save you from multiple referral to patients and also when you refer this patient, say, assuming you found something in the uh, esophagus or uh, in the trachea or bronchus, at least you will send a positive diagnosis to the appropriate specialist. 
this is another patient, the patient with dysphagia. So you can see that this patient has got a thrush in the pharynx, but actually there's a lot in the esophagus as well. Now, if you don't do the TNO, you won't be able to see that. This is the patient just two weeks after treatment with flu colazole. So this patient has also got right vocal paralysis, but you can see the esophagus is nice and clean now from that. Another example is this patient. So this patient presented to my clinic with dysphagia. When you look at it, it looks clean, like there's nothing there. But when I do TNO on this patient, it's completely different picture that I could see there. So you can see the esophagus is full of thrush. Now, if I didn't do the transnasal esophagoscopy, I wouldn't be able to find this thrush that is causing this dysphagia. So uh, my next talk is gonna be on the balloon dilatation. So I use a Cook medical balloon dilatation, but there are other uh, balloons as well, uh, like the uh, Boston uh, uh, dil dil uh, dilators. So with this patient here, so this is one of my patients that presented with cracopharyngeal bar. So you can see on the picture on the left side, the bottom swallow there showing a significant cracopharyngeal bar. So a cracopharyngeal bar is just a protrusion of the cracopharynx. This may be due to hypertrophy or scar or fibrosis there. So you can see half of the uh, esophageal inlet is being taken over by the cracopharyngeal bar. So I'm just gonna play the video for you. This is a complete TNO performed in the office on the local anesthetic. So I spread the patient's nose with cofinalkine, which is a 5% uh, lidocaine with phenylephrine and then spray the pharynx as well and the vocal cords as well, just to prevent patient having a choking sensation. Okay, there's lots of secretion there. I think that's what's making me that. That's uh, that quick. So, getting down. So that, that is the esophagus there. And just esophageal junction and down into the stomach. So now this is a retrograde examination of the gastroesophageal junction. So there are two ways you can introduce the balloon. You can pass it through the same or the opposite nostril, or you can use the guide wire that passes through the channel and then take the guide wire, take, take, take your scope out and then pass the balloon over the guide wire. So this is the balloon going through the postnasal space. and on the direct view into the cracopharynx. So the whole procedure will be just under half an hour. So I use size 20 millimeter inflation and the balloon stays there for one minute and then we take it out. Well Well, the score of zero, no pain, and ten. It was severe pain. Well, in the nose part, it was. Um, they called it paper because especially when it goes to the bone. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Gerald here occasionally it got the pie, but not not for long. Not for long. No. What about the pain in the throat? When the pressure was up. Um, yeah, that, that was. Um, so here I'm just assessing his pain. So I normally score all patients whether they have pain or discomfort from zero to 10 uh, uh, in, for, in the nose and in the throat, and sometimes in the stomach. The reason why they may have pain in the stomach sometimes is when you inflate the stomach, then the gas can get some, give some pain. In such cases, you will need to aspirate. And uh, during the balloon dilatation, they will have the pain or discomfort for one hour, for one minute, uh, uh, during the uh, stretching of the cracopharynx. Some patients may have some pain in the nostril as well, but now I'm using uh, like instigel, just like a KY jelly with lead or it in the nasal cavity to reduce the pain as well. After 30 minutes, you can eat and drink. Yeah. Because you're throwing it with now yeah. <laughs> with a coffee, yeah. <laughs> so in half an hour, so it's, um, yeah. it's quarter to 10 now, so what yeah. about? 20 past yeah. 10, you can yeah. have something to eat and drink. Okay. 
Okay. And this is your appointment. I will see you back in the two hours. Okay. And you go on your way out. You yeah, you must look at it. So traditionally, in the past, we would have admitted this patient, give them a general anesthetic, do this procedure, and then they may stay another night in the hospital. But this business with the TNO, the whole thing is just rounded up within just half an hour, and the patient is gone. This is another patient. It's a 55-year-old gentleman with, uh, who had pharyngolaryngectomy and radial four and flap, followed by radiotherapy. So you can see this patient has got a stricture there in the uh, upper esophagus. So I'm just going to play the video for you for the balloon dilatation. So this is just a speech valve there, you can see. And this is the balloon. And this has been deflected. So you can see it's twice the size. So most of this dilatation, in some cases, is only to do it once. The rotation is that we may need to repeat it six months or 12 months down the line. Every patient is different in this case. This is a patient that complained about pulling of saliva in her throat, chronic cough, and sensation of lump. And you can see why she's having that is because she's got like uh, uh, some narrowing in the calcopharynx as well. And she was fine after the balloon dilatation. So this is the guide wire going through the channel. And that's the balloon there stretching. Again, it's all on the local anesthetic. This particular patient has got a stricture. You can see that. It's quite a very long stricture there. And this was following chemo radiotherapy for squamous or carcinoma for larynx in the larynx about five years previously. So the patient had dysphagia to both solid and liquid. So you can see the guide wire there, and then the balloon in there now. So you've seen different case presentations here, the cryopharyngeal bar, post-radiotherapy, post-surgical uh, uh, removal of, uh, of a tumor. This can all benefit from your TNO. So this is me irrigating the wound area just to check that there's no Perforation, there's a small mucosal tear there because it was a very tight structure there. Again, this is another patient with calcopharyngeal bar. With this patient, I had to repeat his procedure a couple of times. So the second time the patient came, I had to use double balloon and I had to do that under sedation because it is very painful with the sedation. Now, why would I be using double balloon? The reason is because the calcopharynx is not a circular opening. It's like a kidney shape. This has been demonstrated by my very good friend, Peter Belewski from Sacramento, uh, where he put the balloon in a cadaveric uh, pharynx and then did an X-ray uh, with a biome and it shows that it's actually a kidney shape. So this is where some of these patients will benefit from double dilatation at the same time, because if you just use one, it may just be one part of the calcopharynx that is dilated. What about foreign body? Can we check your foreign body through the TNO? Yes, we can do that. So this is a patient that's presented with a uh, history of food stuck in the throat. And this is what we found. So she was eating chicken and she had dysphagia from that. So you can see lower down here, this is the foreign body there. So if you're gonna use TNO for that, you can inflate it and then it drops in the gastroesophageal junction. We can see in this patient, there is a lesion there. So 
You see that lesion there? So I took a biopsy from that. And then I push the, foreign, the, the meat into, uh, into, uh, into the uh, uh, stomach. But first of all, I sort of tried to pull it out if I could, but that didn't work. And if you're gonna pull it out, you might have to take it out through the mouth. So you can see the meat in the stomach. There it is. So we're sure that it's going to its final destination safely. And that's a biopsy I'm taking from the gustus fragile junction there. Again, fish bone, you can easily take that using the TNO. So that's a forcep going into the TNO to take this fish bone. This patient was going to go to the theater for this minor uh, procedure, but I managed to intercept this patient and took the patient to the office and then removed the fish bone. So it's a very soft bone, just easily took it out through the nose. Just like that. Right. What about general anesthetic? Because if you don't have facilities for doing this on the local anesthetic, yes, you can do that on the general anesthetic. The view is quite good, uh, but sometimes esophagoscopy can be a problem on, uh, with the rigid scope because the light source may not be great enough. So this is a patient with hypertrophy of the carcopharynx, as you can see there. So although it is nice opening there, but there's a the very huge bulky carcopharyngeal muscle usually is due to laryngopharyngeal reflux. So in this patient, just using one balloon is not sufficient. So you can see I've put one balloon and it's still some space there. So I use two balloons. So this is two balloon size 18 inch. So I've stretched it up to 36 millimeter. So it's remarkable how elastic this area is. The maximum of stretch in the past was 40. So you can see just small mucosal tear there, but otherwise it's nicely widely open. I've also injected Botox in this patient because it's quite a significant hypertrophy there and spasm. Uh, this patient has got calcopharyngeal spasm uh, from the history and uh, barium swallow as well. So I'm using balloon there. It's on the general anesthetic. This is a single balloon I'm using for that. And it is a 20 millimeter balloon and I inflate it with normal saline because sometimes the balloon can burst and the water or the saline can go into the trachea. But if it is just 20 mils of normal saline, it is absolutely safe. So you leave it there for 60 seconds. and then deflate it, it all comes out. Just like that. Now, this next case is a very, it was a very challenging and uh, interesting case. She was an 82 year old lady with inclusion body myositis. Now, this is a condition why by the patient's old, uh, antibodies uh, damages some of the, the muscle fibers. So this patient uh, developed this sagia, and she was inserted with a peg and the peg fell out and the gastro team uh, couldn't put the peg back because there's just no entrance at all to the esophagus. So this patient has got total dysphagia, as you can see there. And the only option the patient had was an open gastrostomy, but she's not well enough uh, for that. So on the general anesthetic, I uh, performed the pharyngoscopy you can see I'm trying to find where the opening is. There's no opening at all, it's completely sealed. So you see the balloon is not going in there. So I had to use a blunt instrument like a, a cup faucet to gently tease the mucosa in there. As you can see it there, just coming out. And I was able to find a very small lumen there. This is the patient's barium swallow beforehand. I'm just trying to illustrate to you how completely blocked is. This is, there's no dye going down at all. So I have to put a bit of pressure there and they insert it. Another way you can do this is by doing it joint, jointly with the gastroenterologist uh, or the OPAS uh, GI, whereby you can pass uh, 
the guide wire or the camera through the peg tube uh, from below. And then you can meet up somewhere halfway. So with this patient, I use double balloon there because I want to get the maximum dilatation there. And this is the second balloon going in and then you flesh the two balloons all simultaneously. You can see one inflated. And there's the second balloon. This is two 15 millimeter balloons, so up to 30, stretch it. And it's always good to have a look further down into the esophagus because sometimes this patient may have more than one stricture. So in this case, luckily it's just one uh, stricture in the calcopharyngeal level. So I'm just using the CNO to have a look inside. So this is the esophagus there. And that's the stomach there. And this is the patient four weeks later. And you can see the calcopharynx healed nicely. And there's esophagus there. And then she saw it. She was so pleased this lady, she actually wrote her story on a newspaper, on the Daily Mail. So some of you would have this old bougie bougie in the theater, do not throw them away, please, because even though we have this balloon dilatation, there are times whereby the bougie may become handy and useful. And I will show you one example. So this was a patient with total dysphagia following chemo radiotherapy for neck uh, node and neck metastasis. And she has pegged you for a year and she did not like this peg at all. And she, despite the peg tube, she was losing weight. She's not nourished at all. And she asked me if I can stretch. And you can see, I tried to stretch on the GA. It's completely blocked. There's a stricture at 15 centimeter, nothing there. So I managed to perforate the, this membrane there. Uh, this is just the anesthetic uh, guy, uh, bougie I used. And I, th I thought, oh, that's fine. It's a, it's a straightforward one. But this patient has multiple structure. So there was another structure at 20 centimeters. And I said, okay, this should be the last structure I'm gonna, I'm gonna have now. After this, we should have a nice clear passage. There couldn't be possible more than, and then there is another, there was another one at 25. And so, okay, what's going on here? And another adhesion at 30 centimeter, and then a structure at 35. So the whole of the esophagus actually is almost completely closed. And so step by step, I managed to stretch it and dilate it. With this patient, it should be impossible to do a joint double approach from below because if you go through the uh, stomach, there are multiple structures, so you're not gonna meet up anywhere at all. So this is, you can see the peg tube from inside there. And uh, this is the patient just a few weeks post off. So I've passed this gastric tube just to be sure that I've kept it pertinent. And this is it. So the patient is eating and drinking fine. The reason I put in this gastric tube is just so that this, it doesn't close back and I will be able to stretch if needed. So I, and six months later, I saw this patient in the clinic for her follow-up. And, uh, and she said to me, oh, you saved my life. And I said, how did I save your life? I haven't said you saved your life because you had cancer, you had surgery that saved your life. And she said to me, she was gonna take her life if she's not able to eat by mouth because at her age, she feel like life is not worth living if she can't go out with her family, she can eat what she wants and all just fit into the tube, everything is just worthless. And that was what she meant by this procedure that I did saved her life. This is another patient again, and this is again the importance of making sure that we don't just rely on the peg tube, we need to, this patient, may need examination of the upper esophagus. So this patient had total dysphagia after radiotherapy for supraglottic tumor 12 months earlier. And she didn't like the pet tube at all. Everyone kept saying to her, well, you're getting your nourrition. What's the problem here? But she doesn't like to be living on just the pet tube because again, same thing, she doesn't feel like life is worth living. So I managed to gently tease the adhesion, stretched it. But the most interesting thing on this patient was that she had a synchronous tumor at the upper esophagus. 
So I'm using double balloon here. The reason I use double balloon is to be 100% sure that I've stretched it maximally. So this is this patient, and I had a look further down, and you will see here in a moment, there's a tumor there. So there's a small cancer growing there. And if not because I've looked and dilated and stretched, this patient wouldn't have been able to be diagnosed with this tumor there. Now, so that is it. This is about balloon dilatation. The next step is gonna be endoscopic CO2 laser cracopharyngeal myotomy. This is my approach for treating uh, uh, pharyngeal pouch. Uh, I've changed over from using staple device because uh, sometimes the staple device may fail to clip, but also if it's a small pouch, it's difficult to cut the fiber. And until you cut up to 90% of the fiber, the patient will still have this phage here. So this is a patient of mine. You can see the barium swallow there showing this uh, pharyngeal pouch. So this is just uh, an illustration of my approach for uh, CO2 laser, pharyngeal pouch, division of calcopharyngeal uh, muscle. So that's the Killian dehiscent area. You can see the pouch over there. And this is the muscle that I'm gonna be cutting. And this is the barium swallow of this patient pre-op. So it is quite a large pouch. Often people said, well, it's a large pouch. How can it help if you just cut the muscle? What you seem to forget is that it's not a pouch that is causing the dysphagia. It's a calcopharyngeal muscle that is causing this dysphagia. If you go and take the pouch and leave the muscle, the patient will have dysphagia still. So the key really is to address the muscle. So this is a calcopharyngeal muscle there. I use laser set at one watt at high magnification of the microscope and cut through almost all the muscle fiber. If you're concerned that you cause perforation, you can put a stitch there as well. So when you put it at high magnification, you can see all the muscles are gone. It's just a bit of uh, fascia there and fat there, but we've not gone through and through. So I normally put nasogastric tube because sometimes the first day they may have pain swallowing. And if you're not sure whether, or if there's a doubt that you may have perforation, at least you've got the nasogastric tube there, then you can do a, a contrast swallow to check that. And it's always good to check the posterior blade of your uh, diverticulum because sometimes you can, if you force it too much, you may have a perforation at the posterior pharyngeal wall there. So very important to examine this area after you've removed the via the diverticulum, as in this case there. This is another patient, this is quite a large pouch. It is very important that we examine inside the pouch because sometimes you may have square muscle carcinoma developing in the pouch. Uh, one of my uh, head and neck colleague here just operated on a patient a few months ago with a square muscle carcinoma within a pharyngeal pouch. So this is the pouch there. And sometimes we may find so many different things. Two weeks ago, I was doing a pouch surgery. We found a piece of onion in the pouch. So we have to retrieve it because you don't want the patient aspirating that later. So you can see the muscle fiber giving way. So you have to be doing it under high macroscopic examination and magnification. There was a patient that I was doing and there was a big blood vessel uh, underneath that. I know one of my colleagues, Mark Watson, had a patient whereby there was an innominate uh, artery uh, below the muscle there. And in such cases, you have to stop. So always have suction monopolar diathermy handy as well, because you may experience some bleeding there. In such cases, you need to use the diathermy to stop the bleeding. So you can see most of the muscles are gone. And because it's a very low power laser, there's no even charcoal form in there. It's just cutting neatly. Like that. So you can see, so you have to be careful posteriorly because the pouch is falling over the esophagus posteriorly there. But if you have a small hole there, 
it's not the end of the world. As long as you recognize that, you can put stitch there to close it. So this is what it looks like post-operatively. You can see most of the fibers are all gone. And normally I give the patient water, just sterile water overnight. And if there's no problem, I feed the patient the next day. Because if there is any perforation, I want to know straight away uh, because I don't want the patient to go home and then six, six days or five days later, you find that the patient is having uh, uh, has had perforation and they will come back with media stenitis. The endoscopic stapling looks like that. So you can see how you can staple that. Some people still use it fine if it works for you, uh, but uh, I use the laser. So in conclusion, patient selection is the key. And then there's a learning curve for these procedures as well. But some of these procedures, when you do them in the office, it saves time and money as well. And less morbidity with these patients when you do them endoscopically. So as uh, Natalie said, uh, I run uh, courses on laser, uh, laryngeal airway, uh, phonosurgery, surgery, transnasal oscoscopy courses. And these courses are fresh frozen cadaver dissection courses and places are limited. We had to cancel it last year because of the COVID pandemic, but hopefully soon we're gonna resume once uh, things have got better worldwide. The first question was from Syed Hassan, who's uh, got three questions here. Is the endoscopic uh, um, evaluation done by rigid or flexible scope? Now, I, th I know that there was a video of that, but I'll let you answer that. Um, so what, what is his question? So the question is, when you do the endoscopic evaluation, um, mm. I, I suspect under general anaesthetic, I think, um, are you using the, just the rigid or are you using the flexible scope? I um, use the, the flexible know. scope, the transnasal um, uh, oesophagoscope. So I know in the clinic you use a transnasal oesophagoscope and yeah, under yeah. general anaesthetic you do a rigid, um, rigid oesophagoscope or you suspend a pharyngoscope and then can use the flexible scope to go through once it's all suspended and you know the entrance you go with a, a transnasal yeah. oesophagoscope. Yeah, you can, you can do that as well, but usually if I am to assess on the general anesthetic, I use the rigid scope throughout the, the long uh, oesophagoscopy and you can put and, um, a telescope through that as well. There's not huge advantages using a flexible over the rigid uh, I think that patient I showed you earlier with myositis, and it's mainly because I wouldn't with an intention the possibility that I may use the TNO for other purposes while I'm there as well. Uh, but actually, if you're going to go for rigid, most of the time you just do the rigid on the general aesthetic because you have different length of the oesophagoscope, and I can pass the long oesophagoscope right into the stomach, although risk of complication is higher and the complication can be. Uh, fatal as well if you perforate in the chest level. Fantastic, thank you. There is a second question from um, Saeed. He's got, he's asking, um, what's the ideal treatment for the fungal involvement of the pharynx and esophagus and how long do you treat it? I give them fluconazole depending on their body weight, uh, either 50 milligrams if it's a small person for two weeks or if it's a large person, I give them 100 milligrams for two weeks. And I think just that sometimes if you've yes, got any liver failure as well, you need just need to. Yeah, there's, there's nestatine as well as an option. So if you're worried about liver uh, failure uh, or liver function, then you can use the nestatine 100,000 international units four times a day for two weeks. Perfect. And then review the patient. Some of the patients may have recurrent of this thrush if they have like underlying comorbidity like diabetes or if they're on immunosuppressive medication. Now we have another question about, um, can TNO be done without sedation? I do all of my TNO on the local anesthetic spray and not with sedation at all. I've never used sedation when I do TNO. So it's all in my clinic and I do that with local anesthetic spray and then it's looking spray to the pharynx, just like you're passing the nasogastric tube. Yeah. And it works very well, it's tolerated really well. Yeah. 
So um, there's been a few questions about esophageal tears. And for example, if you're in the clinic with a transnasal esophagoscopy and balloon dilatation under local, how do you proceed with managing a patient with a mucosal tear? So if it's a mucosal tear, don't do anything. It will just heal by itself. I would be surprised if you're able to perforate in the clinic on the local anesthetic because the patient will have so much pain that the patient will not let you proceed. Yeah. So I think the reason why we have tear in the general anesthetic is because the patient is asleep and we overstretch. We keep stretching like there's no end of the world there. But on the local anesthetic, you will not perforate with the stretching. You could perforate if you force the TNO in there when you're doing the TNO. But even that, the patient will stop you. And it's a higher chance if there's a pharyngeal pouch. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so cool. um, the next question is about more about complications. Um, what happens and what do you do if a balloon bursts when you're dilating in the clinic? <laughs> Maybe I shall allow you to answer that, Natalie. But, <laughs> but um, if the balloon bursts, this is it's just normal sailing. Usually, it, you'll just you'll just hear the pop. And the patient will cough and you also and swallow the water. It's just normal selling. You don't do anything, just get a new balloon. And so that was one of the first things that you taught me was that uh, the most important thing is not to inflate with air, not to inflate with water, but to inflate with normal saline. So that if it is, if it does burst and it aspirate, you aspirate it into the lungs, then at least it's um, um, better for the patient than um, if it's water. Yeah, because it's just 20 mils of normal saline that is in that. And if it bursts, maybe five mils will get into the trachea. But the patient's vocal cord, because of the, that reflex thing, they will stop it. And then the rest, the patient will just swallow it. Yeah, I, I th it's unusual for it to burst uh, unless it has a fault on the balloon. Or if you over inflate, because you need to inflate maximum six atmospheric pressure. If you look at the labels there on the, on the, on the balloon itself, it tells you the maximum stretching, but if you get carried away and keep inflating, then it will burst. Now, um, the question was, how do you manage such a complication? Essentially, it's um, the, With the mucosal tear. The uh, the balloon bursting. Oh, the the balloon burst. This is nothing happens. It looks pristine clean there when it bursts. So you just the patient will swallow, cough a bit, and get a new balloon because it doesn't leave any damage there. Now it's the next question is other than balloon, um, double balloon dilatation, would you consider GA, general anesthetic as the first line in any other situations? And is there anything to preclude you from trying a TNO first? Uh, so the patient, this, we're talking about patient selection here and whether to do it in the office or in the theater and what makes me decide to do that in the office or rather in the theater. So most of the patients, uh, if there is a, a reasonable lumen there, I will offer them a local anesthetic. But if the patient has got a total dysphagia or if it's just like a pinhole, like they have got a peg, nothing is going from the top, I will go for a general anesthetic. Now they're just asking you about the um, the super pulse um, continuous laser settings. Um, yeah. What do you use for your um, cricopharyngeal myotomy? So I use CO two laser, super pulse continuous, usually at one watt. I have a, a scanner laser, uh, but if you don't have the scanner, the spots it's, it will do equal. It will do the same job as well. The advantage to the scanner is there's less uh, scar formation there. So on vocal cords, they're very good. But for the cricopharyngeal myotomy, uh, I use a very small low energy because I don't want to use too high energy on the laser so that not to create perforation. Okay, we've got some questions specifically about pathology here. What are your thoughts about keratoacanthosis and of salmon patches? Keratoacanthosis and some patches. Um, I think some of this, you have to take your biopsy to be sure that this is what you're seeing. And because you may find that actually they may have some displays or they may have some 
uh, chronic inflammation there, or they might have uh, eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, so if I see some changes, any changes I see there, I take a biopsy. How often have you had to revise your endoscopic pouch surgery, um, if at all? Uh, with a CO2 laser, I've not had a single patient that have come back for a revision. However, I know one will come one day. I've not done 100 yet uh, because the revision rate could be up to 3% or more in some cases. Uh, so I'm not saying that it's not going to happen, but I'm pretty sure, I am hope it doesn't happen, but it's going to happen. But I've done quite a significant numbers of them and no recurrence. Okay, there's a question about ingestion of button batteries and after removal, you found a burn and possible perforation. How do you manage it? Depends on where the perforation is. If it is lower in the thoracic esophagus, I will have to manage it with a cardiothoracic team. I will normally pass in as a gastric tube, give them antibiotics and anti-reflux medication. They may or may not require steroids. Steroids is probably less helpful unless if the airway is affected as well. If it is higher up, in the pharynx, again, I will use a gastric tube uh, just to allow the area to heal anti-reflux medication and antibiotics, um, and then wait for uh, the granulation to settle down. It may heal and stop completely. It may have a perforation there, uh, or a fistula even in some cases, in which case, again, if it is higher up, you can close it up, but if it is lower in the chest, this is a case that you have to manage with uh, the OPA uh, GI doctors and the cardiothoracics. And of course, if it's, uh, I've had this with um, children, PED surgery as well. Yeah. Um, so we've got some more questions here. Um, so a question about pressure manometry in patient, of which patient cohorts are you thinking about uh, manometry testing? Uh, First of all, manometry uh, testing, it's, uh, it's, there is two school of thought on it. One will say to you, you need them in all of these patients that you are querying, oposophageal uh, uh, narrowing, like say spasm uh, or some kind of dysfunction. Uh, one school of thought say, well, it doesn't change your management for anything at all. It's, some people say it's academic. Uh, it's not readily available a lot. I don't think it's something that ENT rely much on. Uh, but the gastroenterologists, they use it a lot because they measure the rest of the esophagus with it as well, and they assess it as well. So for me, it's not something that I use a lot. So, and maybe I should be using it a lot. I don't know. Uh, I, I am open about it, and I'm, I'm hoping that uh, I'm going to find somebody that uses it a lot that I can learn some more with the manometer from that person. We have a really good question. Is the balloon um, to the cricopharyngeus helpful if there's just cricopharyngeal spasm and no stricture? Yes. Uh, the reason is because spasm really, <laughs> to diagnose it is not easy. And one of the reason why I diagnose patients with spasm is because often when you do the barium swallow, the radiologist will say it's normal. And when I look critically, some of the views you may find actually there is some indentation. And these patients, they can swallow, but they have this sensation of obstruction each time. And when I stretch them, they feel better. The options also is Botox injection for this patient. You can inject Botox in the office or in the operating room. Uh, the downside of Botox in the office is uh, if you don't do many of them, you can easily inject into the posterior crack or arytenoid muscle. And again, you cannot inject big doses as well. Uh, so uh, general anesthetic probably is more precise, but again, there's a morbidity with the general anesthesia. And sometimes you may think it's just spasm and if you inject Botox, it may not work because it may just be some fibrosis in the muscle. But if you use the balloon, at least it's gonna just stretch the whole thing. Plus with the Botox, you're gonna to have to repeat it after a few months in some case, because it wears off after three months. With the balloon, not quite often you need to repeat it. Sometimes just breaking the fibers, they're stretching with the, with the balloon 
does give them quite a long last uh, effect. We've had uh, some uh, study just recently completed. We've sent it for uh, for publication. It was, uh, it's a medical, it was a medical student project. So hopefully uh, we're gonna see the outcome and the number of times that we do balloon dilate these patients after the first dilatation. Uh, does TNO have a role in Barrett's esophagus? TNO should be actually the first line of management in surveillance for Barrett's esophagus. Because you can, it's, a, it's, it's an examination that is easily done and morbidity is less, you can easily take a biopsy. I think one of the reasons why Barrett's is not being followed with surveillance uh, is to do with the cost. Because if all patients with Barrett's will have to come for an OGD, I don't think the NHS would cope with that. Although there are some studies showing that the risk is minimum, but we know that there are some that will turn out to be uh, cancer. Uh, so this is why some of the bodies they do follow them would say once a year or two yearly. But I think if every department will have their own TNO, especially in the END, you will find that these patients with bodies will be screening them more often. And uh, in my clinic, when I see bodies, I take a biopsy and then refer the patients to the gastroenterologist to do the rest. Who in our trust also do TNOs. Yeah. Um, can you use air when you're balloon dilating instead of normal saline? You can use air, but the manufacturer said to use the saline uh, because if you use air, you know you're not going to get get enough pressure to stretch. Uh, based on the description, the six, the six atmospheric pressure can only be attained if you have liquid in there. Okay. Now, so do, not, do not be afraid. Why would you look to use air? Are you afraid of normal selling going into the, uh, into the stomach or the lungs? It's, it's, it's nothing there to worry about if it bursts. And again, and again, I've done loads and hundreds of TNO. There's just one case that, uh, that burst and the patient didn't even feel anything at all. Yeah. So um, if you do get a mesocosal tear or, a, or a, a, you perforate and you put an NG tube in, it, as you said, at the end, the mucosal tears, you don't tend to put in an NG tube. But if you did need to put an NG tube in for a patient with a larger perforation, how long would you keep it in? So I'll keep it for at least a week and then I'll do a contrast swallow to check the size of the perforation. So if I suspect I do a power, I have a perforation, now within 24 hours, I'll do a contrast swallow just to check to be sure whether it is the case. And if there is truly a perforation there, uh, nail by mouth, uh, antibiotics, nasogastric tube, and then I will repeat it in a week time again. And if it seals, then I'll take the tube out and then feed the patient. Because you remember with the uh, OPA GI surgeons, they do anastomosis. So they will have lots of perforations around the area. They put it as a gastric tube. Sometimes they feed the patient after five days, actually, as well. And sometimes they say, actually, early feeding this patient will probably enhance with the healing. But I would wait for seven days and then do another contrast swallow. Not the bite so a contrast swallow, just at least if there's any leak, it doesn't go into the mediastinum. Perfect. Now, we're reaching um, eight o'clock, so there's just two very short questions here. Um, someone's asked if there were white patches here and there in the hypopharynx, do you think they should get antifungals? Yes, yeah. I think if I see any white patches there, almost invariably it will be thrush. And then finally, what's your standard local anesthetic protocol for a TNO? The standard local anesthetic is to spray the nasal cavities each side with five pots of 5% lidocaine with phenylephrine. It numbs the nose and it dilates it as well. And also the reason I do both nostrils because sometimes you're not sure which side is gonna be more patent. And I also use 10% uh, xylocaine uh, oral spray into the uh, pharynx. I will spray the epiglottis and then I will spray the vocal cord as well because sometimes if you're doing balloon dilatation, when you touch uh, the epiglottis, the patient will be choking. Um, oh, one last question. I want to make sure that that is, that is answered. How can you spray the epiglottis? Two ways. Ah, yeah, 
there are so many ways you can spray the epiglottis. The easiest way is to hold the patient tongue. So spray the soft palate first, and then the, the, the nozzle on the spray, you bend it by 90 degrees, and then you have an assistant showing you the epiglottis, and then you can spray directly onto the epiglottis uh, or into the uh, vocal cords. Or you can use what we call mucosal atomization device. It's just like a cannula, like a catheter. Uh, you can see it, you may find it in your anesthetic room and then you bend it slightly by 90 degrees or maybe even a curve suction if you don't have this uh, fancy gadget. Or you can put it through the TNO channel but there's lots of dead space in the TNO channel. So you may, use to, you may need to use uh, epith epithelial catheter and then pass it through the channel and then you put some droplets there. So there are so many ways that you can do that. 